we're back to another exciting time in, on tap. We have uh, an excellent guest for you tonight. We have Alan Billings working the booth once again. Alan, say hello to the lovely crowd. Or not. Alan Billings cannot say hello to you. Hello. Hello, crowd. <laughs> All right. That was Alan Billings, ladies and gentlemen. If you have any questions for our guest or for me, if you don't like my shirt even, give us a call at 203-265-6310. It's surprising I still need to read that off. I should have memorized it by now. Uh, also, let's go through the hashtags. What hashtags we got tonight, Alan? Hashtag WPAA. Uh, that doesn't look like a V. That looks like uh, yeah, I actually, it's a I'm, carrot. Yeah, I, I used two little carrots, and uh, I put two little dashes together and made it look like a V. But th that's a different hashtag. <laughs> Hashtag WPA TV. Right. Use that on Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, wherever better social the, medias are found. Yes, Google and, Plus and, is not a better social media, by the way, Alan. I, you should rephrase what you said. And of, and of course, we had the uh, hashtag comment on tap, which you can use, of course, on any social media that uses hashtags. Yes. Let's, let's get this trending tonight in Wallingford. Let's get this trending in New Haven County. You know what? Better yet, let's get this trending in, Hart, in uh, all of Connecticut. All right. So we have an excellent guest tonight. Uh, somebody from uh, Wallyford, somebody from the studio. We're going to get to him in a second. Uh, we're going to go through some uh, news topics of the day. So, Alan, what's your opinion about uh, net neutrality being struck down by the Supreme Court? That is ridiculous. Actually, that is that's not the Supreme Court. I think it's like a uh, appellate court appeals. I believe. Uh, oh, the pe por uh, court appeals? Yeah, yeah. That, no, that's ridiculous. I don't think it should have happened. Well, they're basically the ruling was that the uh, FCC does not have the jurisdiction to actually make laws. The FCC, the FCC can't make laws. Yeah, that's that's correct. Yes, and so that's why it was struck down. So, 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 what was actually struck down? The for, fact, for, net neutrality. Net neutrality is not. You cannot bind. You cannot bind Comcast to, uh, to. Comcast can charge you more if you for access to Google than they can charge you for access to Yahoo. Okay, that makes sense. Not really. It limits free speech. No, no. I mean, I mean, it makes sense that they can't charge you more for it. But they can now. Oh, they can. Oh, yes, because they struck down the FCC uh, decree because the FCC does not have legal ability to make laws. Yeah, but the FCC can still apply to make a bill, correct? They can do a lot of things, but if it goes to Congress, it will not pass through Congress right now. Interesting. So, Alan, did you ever hear the other big exciting tech news of the week? Uh, hit me up. What's up? Uh, Nest was bought out by Google. R wow, that's big. They're going to operate as a separate company. Uh, and they're basically they were bought out by Google because they need a cast of function because they basically ran out of money with angel investments and in, mm -hmm. uh, VC. Uh, for people that don't know about uh about venture capitalism, uh, basically you keep getting money and they keep giving you money and your company gets worth more and more money. And eventually you run out because they expect you to go to IPO. So it was easier for Nest to just get bought out and get the cast of function of three point two billion dollars from Google instead of um. Waiting for an IPO. Yeah, or but I, like that. I think this is really big time. This is huge. I mean, imagine a company like Google that can like do just about anything with technology, and then they buy out a company like Nest. I mean, they bought Waze, and look how like awesome Waze is. Yes, but the thing is, uh, Nest is operating by itself. It's 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 a wholly owned subsidiary. So, so it's owned by Google. Yes, it's not, not operated by Google. Yes, okay. It's, it's just a company Google bought. It's in their portfolio. It's three point two billion dollars. So. Yeah, I would think the, the company is. I mean, Nest alone was a huge company, but Nest their wasn't stuff a is huge expensive. company. It had eight employees or something like that. It wasn't that big. Oh no, no, no I'm saying it's huge as in popularity. Yes. I mean, everybody knows what it. It's always at CES every year. Yeah, so people love buying three hundred dollar thermostats, one hundred fifty dollar uh, smoke detectors, which I have a smoke detector from Nest and a thermostat. That is amazing timing, but I don't think anyone cares. <laughs> Alan, you you are you you're the best, Alan. <laughs> I am the only and the best <laughs> producer in the business. Did you hear uh, uh, in other unrelated news? Uh, you like comic book superheroes, don't you, Alan? No, I do not like comic book superheroes. Don't you like uh, comic book But I'm, I'm booking a comic book ser superhero uh, drawist for you. So. A drawist? A, 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 a drawer. A person that draws, that, that creates the comic books. Yep. Well, we'll talk about that at the end of the episode of what's coming up in the next couple of weeks. Cool. Uh, but... They basically, they killed off Spider-Man in 2012, and they're resurrecting him in uh, 2014 in May. And they actually, the image, I didn't have time to give you this image. It's him very, like, Christ on the cross with, like, the arms spread out, the bent knee. That's their image they were using to introduce Spider-Man back. Amazing Spider-Man comes out April 2014. 
does it um uh, there was a uh, controversy between Spider-Man between how he did the uh web thing. Uh one of them was he used uh his fingers to make the shape of uh the I love you like with your hands. Yeah. And that was that was in uh the comic book series and in the video series he actually just uses uh one finger. Like this? Yeah. So he actually just uses his uh I think it's his middle finger. Might be his middle finger. He uses this. only one of his fingers to do it, and then in the in uh, the comic book series, he uses two fingers. This. What does he use in the Spider-Man movie? I don't know. I, I'm guessing he uses the the only one finger. No, I think in the movie he might use two because he does a scene where he's like trying to figure it out. Uh, we ne- we need to hire a comic book expert, Timon. Um, uh, Roos knows a lot about comic books. Well, Roos is not calling in today. Maybe he is. Maybe, but we're not going to talk to him for 20 minutes. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go on to more important things like your guest. All right. So we have a very special guest. Uh, he has his own show here at WPA, uh, Tuesdays at 8, 8 o'clock, I believe, right? Yes, it is. Uh, we got the lovely and talented Bobby O. Hey. Hello, everybody. How you doing? Good to see everybody. How you doing? Thanks for having me on. Uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for yeah. coming on. <clears throat> So uh, let's just start off and like uh, tell me about yourself. You're from Wallingford, correct? Yeah, I'm from Wallingford my whole life. Uh, schooled in Wallingford, I went to Simpson School. I was the I was the last class to go from kindergarten through fifth grade at Simpson School. The year after we left uh, my fifth grade, when I went to junior high school at Dag Hammersholt, yeah. uh, St- Simpson School was closed. And right now, it's the elderly housing on Center Street, and uh, they're going to put subsidized housing in front there, and that's where the school was, and it no longer exists. But uh, then I went on, I went to Lyman Hall High School, and uh, graduated in 1980, uh, took cooking, a little bit of communications, a little bit of a... They had two computers at Lyman Hall. When really? I was at, when I, they had two computers to teach the kids, and I actually met one of the persons that put the computers in the other day. And that's, cool. that's how we, you know, that was the first tech class that they had at Lyman Hall, and I was there when they when they started it. That's cool. So what what did they have you do with these computers? Was it programming? Was it like just like typing? Or? It was just by. It was very binary. What the what it was was they would give we would make these. Uh, they would give you these sheets where the pluses and the minuses and the zeros and the x's, and we would make things like. Uh, candles that we would put a, a you know there would be these they they were very basic and they would print them out and we would we would put in the numbers like it would be zero 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 x x zero 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 and that would that would form eventually would form these uh these pictures on the um on the piece of paper and it would come out very very basic it was the first start it was had that start somewhere yeah and then this and it was like cutting edge we were we were considered you know the the echelon, but it was very very basic. You yeah. know, then compared to today's computer, I mean, yeah. Let's face it; it's uh, we've come a long way. Yeah, I mean, back then, like a lot of programmers, uh, maybe a little before that, they had to punch all the stuff on code. So yeah. like, they punch their the, like basically those scantrons that they punch, and so uh, you you draw a line down one side of it, so you know when that line is diagonal, you know you have the, your cards right, so you can put it in the program. And run. Mm-hmm. So in college, what you do if there's somebody you just want to mess with and they're working on a program, you shuffle the cards before they had a chance. <laughs> and um, another awesome. thing they would do is they would figure out they would so they would have like a typewriter that would punch it like punch the holes in it for them. But so they'd figure out if they hit all the keys at once, they could punch every single hole in these cards. So the machine would try to read it, try to interpret what it was, and the card would catch on fire. The machine. <laughs> I jeez. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, this is kind of nerdy computer stuff. That, that was probably in the 70s. It was before, before uh, they were installed at. Uh, it was 719. I can remember the year. It was 1977. Really? Was the year the two computers. It was the first uh, tech class, a computer usage class. They, they actually, that's what they called it, computer usage. And it was up in uh, B building, halfway down B building. And uh, it was very, very. Uh, it was cutting edge at the time, but right now it's the most basic thing. It was uh, it's kind of interesting. That's pretty cool, though. That's pretty cool they had to do, do that. Yeah, it was, it was easy. <laughs> so, so what did you do after 1980? So now you're, you graduated. You have your cool computer school skills. Well, I, it wasn't really computer skills <laughs> because, all right, who could afford a computer? You know, you, could, you couldn't do anything with a computer. If, even if you had, you know, uh, 
anybody who had a computer, there was no such thing as the internet yet. Yeah. There was no such thing as Facebook. There was no such thing as email. Yeah. There was no way. How would you? Who could you communicate with? Maybe the other hundred people that had computers in the whole world. Yeah. It, it was kind of strange, you know. It was. It, that's the way it was. Yeah. Um, Started following around. I, I, I spent a number of years. I went to school. I, I went back. I was taking classes at Quinnipiac. I took some classes at Quinnipiac. took some classes at uh, Western Connecticut State College. Yeah. And it's and just part-time and everything. And I went to work. Everybody worked. But yeah. I went to school part-time. And I was taking music lessons. I, uh, per, I was a percussionist, playing yeah. percussion. And I wanted to be a weatherman. So I took some classes to... You know, I'm, I'm my spare time. It took me many, many years. I never got a degree in it. Yeah. Um, Dr. Mel was was the uh, head meteorologist at, at Western. He was the professor, and uh, I learned a little bit from him. And uh, we got to be friends. I I knew Jeff Fox was in the classes. He was taking the classes there. And um, what it was was we were on the cusp of super Doppler radar. Yeah. So the people that went through a four year course at Western. At the time I was there, 1983, yeah. those people would, went through three years of school, and then Dr. Mel came in and said, you're going to need an extra two years to learn the Super Doppler. Yeah. And people were mortified. They, could, they, they realized they weren't going to get grandfathered in, and they weren't going to get a degree. They were just going to get a certificate. Yeah. A lot of people walked out of the class. A few people stuck it out, like Jeff Fox, and he stuck it out and stayed in school. He ended up being a meteorologist, but it was an interesting thing. Jeff Fox was called a meteorologist before he really was. Really? He really was. And and I, and I remember this, and a lot of people complained about it. They He did not have a meteorologist degree when he was being called in his first two years. It took him two years to get the Super Doppler. Yeah. And other people got in contact with me when, when they saw him with the title, yeah. meteorologist. Jeff Fox, he really was it. That's funny. And uh, he always sat in front of the class, and he was a, a he was something. He was he was a very prim and proper guy and everything. But he was also he was like sort of snobby to us. He, we, we, yeah. we had a uh, we had a love hate relationship, and you know a lot a lot of people did because yeah. uh, he was sort of the teacher's pet and everything. He was a smart kid. Yeah. But uh, th that's how that went. We never you know a lot of people didn't stay for the super Doppler, and it was it was the end of it. Did a lot of traveling. Did a lot of musical uh, music in my day. Played the, played jazz down in New Haven. Yeah. Played some jazz in New York City. Played uh, in the clubs. Played for. I went went on tour with Eddie Money. I played uh, like seven or eight shows with Eddie Money. Really. And um, it was when Hurricane Katrina hit. We were at the Ohio State Fair, and. Um, they didn't know how bad it was going to rain there, but they knew it was going to be bad down in, in New Orleans. Yeah. New Orleans was evacuated already, and we had buses, so we pulled into the Ohio State Fair, and there was w flood warnings and everything out. The first day we played an afternoon concert, it it was pouring before the show, and then it stopped raining. Yeah, No rain. Well, we did that show, and then everybody went to their bus, and we were trying to catch some shut eye, and... We were evacuated while we were asleep, and they, they were yelling with megaphones. Yeah. Opened up the, the bus door, and there was three feet of water everywhere. Yeah. And we, they were evacuated from the Ohio State Fair, and that was the end of the, that was the, end of the tour. Really? And uh, it was pretty interesting being woken up by the megaphones. We thought that we didn't know who was yelling at us. And it, was, it was pretty hairy. We, we uh, got evacuated, from, and we went home from there. We were all flown home and drove home, and that was the end of that. Really? So do you do you still keep in touch with anybody or? I do, I talk to uh, right now I'm doing the TV show. Yeah. I have I stay in touch with almost all the people. I've tried to expand my network uh, through email, in mail, uh, through the internet, calling people up. I have a I have over fifteen hundred people on my phone list. Really, and I have. Uh, Close to 600 people on my Gmail list. Yeah. My LinkedIn is my LinkedIn is uh, is very extensive. Yeah. What I've done is since I started the show, which is a year ago, well, it, it's the 15th of January right now, so it's it's a year and two weeks yeah. since I've started the show on live, and um, I I think I've I've tripled my my Gmail account. Uh, 
you know, the, every time I get a connection, I try to get two connections. If I talk to a rock star, yeah. I will talk to their promoter. I'll add them in. Yeah. Then I will get I will get every bandmate to put their name in. And if they have a Gmail, I'll get theirs. Yeah. Those connections are essential for getting other guests on the show because what you do is you, you ask a person about a friend of his or you ask for another band and they'll say, well, talk to this guy. And, and it makes it a lot easier to network. Yeah. I've had several guests on my show that, that – want to talk about networking and the way i network is if i talk to you joe and you joe you'll give me alan and alan will give me mike and mike will give me susan and we'll keep going on from there um i never miss a chance to expand uh my my accounts and stuff and just get my name list going Uh, it makes my job a lot easier Uh, i guess it would would just Mm. keep adding more and more people so um so what before we get to your TV show, I think we're going to spend a lot of time on your TV show, but uh, what did you, so for a living, what would you say? Were you a musician primarily for most of your no, life? No, I started, I, I did a lot of things. When I graduated from high school in 1980, yeah. there's a bar right around the corner from here. It's called Jake's now. It was originally called uh, the Brass Rail. The name of the Brass, it was the Brass Rail in this 50s, 60s, 70s. And it was closed down in the late 70s. A gentleman by the name of Danny Donahue owned it. And it was a night spot. They would pack that place on a nightly basis. The back room had these old round tables that you could fit 15 people in each round table. And they had high backs that were higher than your head. So what you could basically do is get lost in there. If someone wanted to see who was there, they had to walk right around the edge and they had to peer into each little opening. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the shows, you know, uh, Casino. Yeah. They had in the, it, it almost was like a casino in there. You could hide in the corner. Yeah. They had live bands. They had music. They had – it was just really a lot of fun. Anybody who was anybody would go there. It was just so much fun, and it was called the Brass Rail. Well, it got shut down. Yeah. Uh, Danny, for whatever reason it was, they just walked away from the place. There was still ice cream in the uh, the refrig- freezers. There was still food in the refri- yeah. refrigerators. There was still beer in the kegs. There was still liquor in the cellar. It was just like they got up and left one day. Yeah. Well, the place wasn't even locked up good. And uh, a gentleman by the name of John Fiango uh, came in, and, and I was standing there, and he was having a gentleman redo the bar. He was stripping the bar. The guy was from Jamaica. Yeah. And he fell off of this big, tall ladder while he was using some volatile chemicals to strip the bar, all the shellac and and the urethane off of the bar. The stuff he was using was caustic, and he he almost killed himself uh, by falling off the ladder. He was a a guy from Jamaica, and he realized he couldn't do it anymore because the fumes from the the stuff was was affecting him. So I told the guy, I said, well, I know how to do this. I've, I, you know, I've, I took wood shop, and I know how to cut this stuff, and I could finish it, and yeah. we did. I got together with a couple of guys, and they hired us, and we finished putting new glass in the behind the bar, stripping the bar, re-urethane in the bar, yeah. sand in the bar. It took us about two months. Yeah. Well, we replaced all the floors, and, we, and that was my first job when I graduated from high school. Yep. Well, it, it took us two or three months to put the place together, and a guy named uh, Freddie De Palmer was the guy who was the main contractor on the job. And John Fiango was the own, owner, and his son worked there too. And Dusty Palmer was going to be the namesake. They called it Dusty's 1890 Saloon. Yeah. And that's what it was. And, and they opened it up, and that place turned into quite a night spot. Yeah. And uh, I moved on from there. You know, Once I opened the bar open and everything, I wasn't much of a uh, – I didn't want to work at a bar, but I, I put one together. So yeah. I moved on, traveled with the Grateful Dead for years. I, I was a big fan of the Grateful Dead, yeah. and I ended up getting in the – I was a travel. I was a, I was a deadhead is what yeah. I turned out to be. Uh, went to school, got some, you know, odd jobs and everything, and for a couple of years I just did nothing but, you know, I was a roustabouter basically. Okay. But uh, I got some really good jobs. I started working for the town of Wallingford, mm-hmm. Board of Education. Okay. Uh, I sense I re- – I, put a number of years in there and I ended up uh, uh, retiring. I got my retirement in so I, I my I got vested with the town so I, after that, you know, uh, I retired and uh, j- basically been uh, I'm on disability now. I've had a couple of leg operations, uh, foot operations for 
the last 10 years or so I've been yeah. uh, on disability because yeah. I've had so many leg operations. So I sort of brought me to this, yeah. where I am right now. And so, uh, and then, then I'm here. Well, we're so. gonna we're gonna ask, I'm gonna ask you after we we're gonna go to a break shortly, but I, I want to ask you one quick thing about uh, being a deadhead and touring with the Grateful Dead, and okay. how was that? So just describe that. So so, I mean, you're obviously the Grateful Dead. They're they're much older than you, right? They're, they're typical fans. They were fans for them from the '60s, right? So you yes. were a younger you were a kid compared to some of their uh, more adult fans. Like the, you were in your 20s, and a lot of their fans were in their 40s. What was it like being in the 80s or? Whatever you were following, what was it li that like? It was really interesting. It, it, I'm glad you asked me that because uh, I was a big fan of the music. When I was a young kid and I was having leg operations, th they had a, um, they had this uh, a news show that was on TV, and uh, it, Walter Cronkite was narrating the war from Vietnam. Yeah, and he cut away from Vietnam, and they went to this split screen where on half of the screen it was. They were showing Vietnam, and the other half was a split screen of Woodstock. Yeah. This was in, like, 1968. And I was a really young kid, and I said, I saw the kids with flowers in their hair sitting in a circle, and I saw these other people shooting guns, and I said, I would like to hang around with the people listening to the music sitting <laughs> in the grass. Yeah. And I just gravitated towards that, and I just remember them having the sign of the Grateful Dead up. Yeah. And I said... I started hanging around people that were older than me immediately. Yeah. From a very young age, I hung around. Even in Newington's Children's Hospital, this kid, Brad, was 15 years older than me. He, yeah. I believe he came back from Vietnam with an injury, and yeah. because he hadn't fully grown, he was getting a prosthetic put on his foot. Yeah. Well, I befriended him, and I befriended the other guys that were there, and I always was hanging around people that were a lot older than me. So when I did follow around the Grateful Dead, I fit in better. Okay. I was never afraid to hitchhike. I was never afraid to ask to get in a club or get ask to get in a venue. I, I was always I was always n n not fearful of it. That's cool. You know. So how many concerts did you see with the Grateful Dead? I saw with Jerry Garcia. Now I, I consider uh, j oh, the concerts with the Grateful Dead when Jerry Garcia was alive. Yeah. I saw the Grateful Dead 198 times Damn. before Jerry Garcia died. Now, since they've called them the dead, they've called them further. Yeah. I've probably seen 20 or 30 shows with just further, and they call them the dead. Yeah. That's Jerry, without Jerry Garcia. Yeah. They, I've seen them with, uh, like, Bruce Hornsby. Cool. I've seen, you know, the Vince Welnick. I've seen them with, now Vince Welnick since died. Uh, I've seen him with all these different setups and everything, and I have seen him. It's not the same without Jerry yeah. Garcia. So do you go to a lot of, uh, actually, I think the first time I met you, you had somebody from uh, Shakedown, I think you're. Yes, in? Dave Frankel, good friend of mine. So do you do you, do you follow? Like, I guess you don't follow because they're local. But do you go to their their shows? Uh, I have seen Shakedown more times than I've seen the Grateful Dead. Really? We traveled around, and every uh, the, I met Dave and the boys from Shakedown at H.R. Uh, Wilfred's in Hamden. Yeah. They played there on a weekly basis, and when they first started playing, I was there right from the inception. They played upstairs, and it was hot. It was in the summer. There was no air conditioning. And we used to just laugh about it because Dave looked a little bit like Jerry Garcia. And, you know, the pseudo-dead bands were big. We needed our fix for the Grateful Dead, and they played Grateful Dead, so it was fine with me. Yeah. We started tra traveling with them. And, we, you know, we, if you saw my show with Dave Frankel on, yeah. <clears throat> we'd have camaraderie. And I, yeah. I, I really like hanging around with the guys and the girls. I'm friends with his whole family. I'm Well, I'm friends with his his family that he brings with the thing. And it was our cut loose. Yeah. We would work all week, and on Friday and Saturdays, we would go to the venues, and we'd camp. We'd cook out out in the parking lot. We'd cook out, and we had, com you know, uh, almost like communal living a little bit, yeah. you know, and, and we'd all help each other out. We'd bring all the equipment in, and we'd play, and we'd dance, and we'd have a good time. That's you know, that's what we did. That's cool. I actually, I saw them once in uh, Naugatuck at some uh – uh Bar. <laughs> they played in a lot of yeah. places. I couldn't name half the. I know they played at Wilfred's Toad's Place. They they're played here in Raleigh for ten times. Yeah, you know, and they're going to play in this room right here, ladies and gentlemen, on on the Bobby O Show. We will have someday. We will have Shakedown play in this stage. That's great. All right, so let's go to uh, let's go to a PSA break, and then we'll come back. We're going to ask uh, Bobby O how he got to become the Bobby O Show. <laughs> Hi, right, everybody. Welcome back to Time It On Tap. Call it at 203-265-6310. Oh, 
We're in lovely Wallingford, Connecticut on a nice, warm, for the seasonably, unseasonably warm day in uh, January. Hit about 50 degrees today. Pretty warm. Now, uh, now we, uh, we're going to get warm a couple more days. This has been a treat. My pipes broke, bu- burst uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, I'm glad I don't have to worry about that right now because the heat's so warm. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. So before we go back to talking with uh, Bob O'Connor from uh, the Bobby O Show, uh, we had to talk about some business. So, Alan, what business do we need to talk about? Okay, so we got some uh, – next week we will not be doing a show. So uh, next week will be a replay of the band that we had, The Awakening. There is actually there's a good reason um, we decided not to do a show because somebody didn't load their video into the TriCaster. So we want to show you their music to do a service for The Awakening so they can actually – so people who watch the show can actually see what they sa- see and hear what they sound like. Yes. Uh, so th- that will replay, fully edit it. With that video in there. And uh, all that can be found at timeonontap.alanbinlinks.com because Timon has not redirected the website yet. Or, so, or it can just be found at WPAA.tv tomorrow night at uh, at uh, 8 t- o'clock. Or, or it, no, it's not no, tomorrow. No, uh, next week at 8 o'clock. Tomorrow night at 8 o'clock is uh, the wrestling show. Yeah, tomorrow night is the wrestling show. Uh, so it will be on the – Watch uh, that. They're good people. Or I guess they are. I've yeah. never met any of them. I mean you can always check it out. Uh, check out the Time and on Tap dot Alan Billings. I got to tell you a funny story about the wrestling show, right? So I had to switch cla- uh, we- uh, days of the week because uh, I was going to graduate school at night, and I had my sh- class was on Thursday night, and I, had s- I told Susan I can't do it. So they switched the wrestling show from Wednesday night to Thursday night with me. Yep. And my, at work, one of my friends came up to me. He's like, hey – I was watching WPA last night because my friend told me to watch. It was his wrestling show. What happened to your show? I'm like, I'm still doing it. He's like, oh, man, I'm glad. I thought they, you got you quit, canceled your show and didn't tell me. I'm like, no, 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 it's just still there. <laughs> He's just, like, so confused by why this wrestling show is on. But uh, the wrestling people have been problems in the past, but I guess they're good now. Yeah, they're doing all right. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so t- st- st- uh, sticking on the studio. Uh, how did you get involved in the studio? Well, it's a very interesting story. This is a great, this is a true story, and it, it's just ironic, and it's, it, I'm going to tell you the whole story. Over the years, um, I've always been animated with not only my friends, but I've been um, the kind of guy that w- that's not afraid to ask somebody that I don't know a question. Yeah. And, and I would get snickers from some people, and some people would laugh, and, and, and always, always people were telling me that I should be on TV. My whole life, oh, you should be on. You should have your own TV show. I would watch if you did, and that went on for years. And it used to aggravate me a little bit. People would say, "Geez, Bob, you know, you want to be on TV? I would watch if you were on TV." And I would always hear it. And then one day, I was at a music festival, and uh, WPAA was covering the music festival, and somebody said, "That lady over there, Susan, would like to talk to you." She said, "You're Bob O'Connor." I said, "Yes, I am." She goes. People have asked us why aren't why you should have your own television show down at the station, and I said, "Really?" And people would always say, "You know, that guy would have a good TV show. I would watch it if Bobby O had his own show. He's great. He's funny." And so uh, it went on and on and on. Now that was three years ago, possibly even four years ago. So that went on for every time I saw Susan, she says, "Are you ready to come on? Are you ready to come on?" And that went on and on and on. Well. Now, this is – we're going to cu- segue into 14 months ago. Yeah. I'm working for my buddy, my one of my friends, and I'm driving his truck that has no third gear. It was, it was an automatic, but when you had to be going on flat ground when you hit third gear because if you didn't, it skipped it out. Yeah. So I was really careful with this truck, and I made sure that if I ever was going to go up a hill that I had a good head of steam going so I would be in fourth gear. Yeah. I drive down Ward Street Extension, and I'm going up Ward Street, and I slowed down for a car in front of me, and I forgot about third gear, and the transmission fell out of the truck. It got caught. It just clanked out. It just uh. stopped. And I just said, oh, my, I can't believe this. So I pulled the car. I could have pulled the car over. I actually was half in the road and half out of the road. So I called my boss who called AAA, and he gave me the number, and I had to call AAA, and I put a cone out behind the truck. Uh. And I'm talking to my boss, and I'm all amming I'm throwing my arms up in the air, and I'm talking, and I'm la- I was actually thought it was kind of funny. Yeah. Well, so I'm going like this, and, I'm nah, nah, nah. and then some guy pulls up. He rolls down the window. He says, O'Connor, he goes, if you did that on TV, I would watch it. And I said, that's it. 
So I told the lady from AAA, I said, the keys are under the mat. I'm not even going to be there. Have it towed to the uh, to Polunsky's. I walked down South Orchard Street, and just by the grace of God, I walked in the front door, and Susan was here. <laughs> I said, how do I start a show? And she she guided me through. You know, they did my background check. They, they took my license. They made a picture of my license. They they asked me what my format was going to be. And I, I was so, Joe, I had no idea what I was going to do. Yeah. But what Susan explained to me was you would want to have somebody that would, could be your direct, uh, technical director, somebody that could help put together a show. Now, I have a close friend, Jerry Sands, and he's, he's my technical director to this day. And, and I, I sort of asked him, I said, Jerry, I sort of signed a letter of intent to do a television show. And he said, you'll never do it. You'll never do it. I said, well, let's go down there. Let's just go down the station and see. Let's see what we're going to do. So we talked more with Susan, and she showed us the studio. Yeah. And um, she she, uh, she said, you have to get guests. And she explained to me how, how to basically start start off. Yeah. I said, okay. So I started off, and, I, and I, I have a close friend. He's on the town council. His name's Bobby Parisi. Yeah. And Bobby Parisi told me. And I told him what I was doing. My aspiration was to start a TV show. He said, if you start a show, I'll be your first guest. Yeah. I got questions for him. I told Jerry what we were going to do, and then what happened was it was very interesting. I had We captured Bobby Parisi's show. That was my first show. We, I had a set. I made my set. We had Bobby Parisi on, and in between my first and second guest, my second guest was going to be Jerry Farrell Jr., and that was the day of Sandy Hook, the day of the, uh, the tragedy at Sandy Hook, and Susan called me up. She said, if you would like to have – um, a call-in show tonight. Just sit there and, and field phone calls from the from the public. You can do it because uh, it was a tragedy. No one knew what to do. And and Jerry Farrell had a friend who's who's a family member that was killed at Sandy Sandy Hook. So they had to go down to uh, Sandy Hook and, and they weren't or uh, to uh, Newtown. And and what happened was uh i fielded phone calls that was my first show yeah my first show was a live show sitting right where you're sitting and i fielded some phone calls and people did call in yeah. it was and and all it was all i i i just sat here yeah. and told people you know we're going through a tragedy folks uh, and uh, you know i basically some of the uh, 26 people died and this is uh, you know um, yeah. It was a very unfortunate circumstance, and I was so green that I didn't have time to be scared. Yeah, I actually was a little scared of you know how people would take it, but they thanked me for having uh, being able to let people vent. Yeah, that was it was it was something that was essential, I guess, and that started me off, and that was my first first time, and that was a year ago. That's well, I would say it's cool, but it's, it's a tragedy. But I mean, it's, it's a, I guess it's been a great it's been a great experience. The first time to start taking phone calls and experiencing how that all I had works. no time to be scared it yeah just like right into the furnace i was yeah. like, i always saw your show and i was like wow live you have no chance to you know you better just be on the ball and you know i said how do they do that and, you know and and you know really there's nothing to be afraid of, of as long as you're prepared and you have a guest there or you know like sometimes you just will you'll talk with alan and you'll have a, another tech guy on yeah you just have to be yourself and and roll with it you know yeah it's what I noticed a lot about live is that, like, you could not have anything to say for a second. It could feel like a year. Like, you just like this, like, uh, like you just have to get through that and be able to say the next thing. I've had guests that got tongue tied. I had a friend on the show, and she was an intake manager, and she, I asked her what her mission statement was, and she froze. We actually had to stop the show and start it off because thank God it was captured because she totally nothing would come out of her mouth. She was tongue tongue tied, yeah. and uh. Deanna, I'm sorry that I had to mention that. <laughs> that <was laughs> See, the, the, the beauty of uh, internet television, you don't know. Uh, you just never know what happened, right? You never know. I mean, uh, like like I said, I, I admire you guys for having a live show. I, I, um, I capture my show, and like I say, Jerry does all my editing and stuff. And Jerry Sands, uh, in case anybody wants to come down and start a TV show, the first thing you should do is get somebody who's willing to go the extra mile yeah. and, and do some of the technical work because I, I, I you know, the uh, 28 South Orchard Street's where you come down and you come down to WPAA. And if you want to start a show, you can sign the letter of intent, but you also 
should think about having somebody that could be your support staff. Um, it's not easy, but it's also it's also a real lot of fun. Um, I work on the average of thirty hours a week uh, for episode for, for to have one, and and that's that's with getting extra guests and you know talking with several guests and writing. Yeah, you know I do write my questions, submitting yeah. questions, and 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 Jerry's busy editing the past shows, so yeah. he's Jerry's doing his thing. Jerry and I rarely talk until basically I- unless a guest cancels. Like, um, it, it, my guess for tomorrow night, like, I capture on Thursday nights yeah. before that wrestling show. Yeah. My set is right here. I capture right where right where Joe's sitting. But my guest is, is going to have a baby, and she's ready to have a baby any minute. So she had to cancel. Now, I have other guests now. I don't even know who the guest is going <laughs> to be, but there's going to be somebody sitting in the chair tomorrow yeah. night. You know, I, I have, the, you know, a, a, a plan. You know, yeah. I have people that are willing to sit in. And we're going to get people, you know, like, it's what you do. It's, you, you don't have time to be afraid of it. Like, I used to get agitated if my guest canceled. I started, oh, man, we're shot. No, we're not. We just, you just have to keep going, you know, and yeah. have to have extra, you know, a contingency plan, I guess. That's what I call it, you yeah. know, and then get the people. Get you got to have a contingency on. plan, right? So it's, yeah. you got to, nobody can ever predict what's uh, going to happen next, right? That's. No, like, you, you know, you, I've, I've watched your show, you never know. Like, if you forget, you'll ask somebody a question on TV. You know, if you get stumped, you got to ask somebody, right? <laughs> Some of the shows were just, like, the wildest thing. Like, um, so we had, I think it was 2000, it was Christmas, last Christmas, the episode before last Christmas. Uh, we had, no, it took... It was weird. I had a weird break because I think I took from think I think think I think it was a week before Thanksgiving. So I had this. And it was like my last. Like it was basically because of the way the calendar worked. I was traveling for business and the holiday mm-hmm. between Thanksgiving and then uh, New Year's. I was just not going to do a show. So uh, actually, I did one show that that time frame, and I was like, uh, so basically, I, I we had this party, and like we had like this guy playing guitar. He did he did show up, and he told me like at seven oh five, he got a text message from like I'm not coming. Like okay, great. And we had like a cake, and like somehow the cake ended up like one of the guests threw the cake at somebody else. It was just like chaos. It was like, and like I had stuff going on. We had callers. We had uh, one episode. I had fifty minutes of callers. So like I literally all I had time for was PSA and the next call. That's all we did for one episode. We and still got the telephone number. Up yeah, two zero three two six five six three one zero. You can call in everybody. This is live, ladies and gentlemen. It is live. It is live, and we're here from WPAA at twenty eight. South Orchard Street in Wallingford, Connecticut. My name is Bobby O. I'm a host and producer of the Bobby O Show. I think you can handle it. Someone's gonna go home now. Uh, <laughs> you gotta stay there, Joe. Yeah, you can't leave. So let's talk about some of your interviews. Let's, let's talk about the worst interview you've ever had and the best interview you've ever had. Well, like I was talking about, my, my best interview is I, I've gotten more polished at it. I've had a lot. I just had Dr. Carrie Picardi on the show, and. Um, it was it, the, she is a very knowledgeable person, and she was ready. What what, what I have to do is the preparation of the show is it, it makes my job a lot easier. Yeah, my it's not about me. What I like to do is just ask the question and then sit back and relax. And if yeah. you watch Carrie on my show, uh, I think it's a, a ninety five to five ratio. She's talking for ninety five percent of the time. I'm talking for five percent yeah. of the time. That's what you want to have. Because the Bobby O Show is about the guest. It's not about anything about me. So what I like to do is I focus on what the guest is. Um, some of the, my, the most memorable guests are Larry Donardis, former congressman. Yeah. Uh, Dave Frankel was a really great guest. I, I, I really had a great time uh, talking with him. He, his insight, what it is, is Dave Frankel's the kind of guy that he works for, for it, 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 his job is very – intense so when he gets out of work he wants to have fun what does he have fun doing he's a musician so what he does is on the weekends he just totally cuts loose and turns into somebody else yeah it's great we have a great time when we get together and he plays his music i'm a musician too i've played with his band Uh we have had so when he came on the show that's that's a real fun interview for me i've had personal friends on i've had historians on i've had the guy who uh I've had uh, you know, Bob Gatilia, for instance. He yeah. came on with uh, with Tom Shepard, and what they what happened was 
Tom was tongue-tied, so Bob took over for him, and they, they talked about the steam cheeseburger machines, Burger Tender. Yeah. And uh, that was a re- that was like a, a, a shot in the dark. It ended up being one of my best interviews because uh, Bob Gatilia is an excellent historian, and he's very knowledgeable, and he, he understands what uh, what's the question. You know, he, under- he goes a little deeper. Yeah. Uh, let's see, some of the other good uh, guests. Uh, my worst one, my worst interview was Johnny Winter yeah. from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Johnny and Edgar Winter, they're uh, albinos. The gentleman is very old, and he's uh, his. Uh, he doesn't like to do interviews, so yeah. I went to the Ridgefield Playhouse, and I went to Toad's place. I had to interview him twice. I may have interviewed him for a total of thirty-five minutes. I got less than five minutes of actual usable footage. Uh, he wasn't answering questions. He was just nodding, laughing. He wasn't into it. He doesn't like the media. Yeah. Um, he even when he was on the David Letterman show, he wouldn't answer the. He didn't answer. They didn't even have him on the show because he wouldn't answer the questions. They, he was supposed to come on after a commercial break. Yeah, they didn't have him on. He was gone. He walked right off stage. It was kind of. It was strange, you know. Yeah. But uh, the guests, like I say, like um. I like the, the uh, town council members and the members of the Board of Ed. I had Dr. Dr. Menzo on, superintendent of schools. Mm-hmm. I've had um, just all those kind of people. It's, a, it's Wallingford. Yeah. I love people from Wallingford. You know, it, it, it's just uh, it's very fulfilling to have people that would be willing to come on. A lot of people are afraid. You know, they, 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 they look at it with a little trepidation at first, but then when they realize it, it's a – I give them the questions ahead of time. There's no ambush on my show. Yeah. I will not, you know, I don't, I don't pull any fast ones on people. And if they don't want an answer or a question, it's because they told me not to, and we won't even ask the question. Yeah. And uh, like I say, it, it's a lot easier for me because my technical director, Jerry Sands, yeah. is the best. I mean, he, what we come out with is a really good Product. Alan, I think you need to shout out Jerry Sands for a couple days. I'll tell you, you know what, Jerry, Alan does a great job, too. It, it's, you know, I got to hand it to Alan, too. A- Alan Billings does a great job with what we have here. He, you know, we, we just had this um, renovations of the studio. Uh, I forget how much it was put in, Alan. Uh, you know, there was a, a lot of money was put into the studio. It was over $140,000 or something like that. And, it was uh, it was a lot of money. I, I can't tell you exactly how much it was because I forgot, but – it was a lot of money, well, and uh, th- we still have we still have stuff that needs to get done to the studio, and we still have you know some money left over to make some more transitions yeah. to uh, change some more things. I'm telling you, we have all new carpeting, all new lighting. We have a brand new uh, control room. It was totally gutted and put together. And, if I'm not and this right. and this is yeah, the control room is completely different. Mm-hmm. New desk, new everything, new uh, microphones. Now we can talk to you uh, through the headset that you're listening to right now. Uh, better phone calls. The phone call is a direct line. No more better uh, phone calls. We have better phone. callers calling in. Yeah, we gotta have callers. <laughs> <laughs> gotta have callers coming yeah. in. We're gonna flash. We're gonna flash that uh, <laughs> that telephone number again, Alan. Two zero three two six five six three one zero is the number to call for Tom and on tap with the guest Bobby O from the Bobby O Show. I dare you to call in. One, my, one of my friends has got to call in right now. <laughs> I want to get somebody to call in. Now, come on. In. Hey, Rich. Richie Tatro, call in right now. I know you're watching, so call in. All right. Mm. Let's, let's go to a quick PSA break. We'll be back in a few minutes, and then we'll go talk, to, talk a little bit more for the last uh, 10 minutes or so. And we are back. Call in for the last seven minutes or so of Time It On Tap, 203-265-6310. We have uh, Bobby O'Connor of the – Famous Bobby O show on WPAA tomorrow night at uh, is it showing tomorrow night? Or are you recording? No, tomorrow? I capture on Thursdays. My shows on Tuesday nights at eight o'clock here on WPAA. Yes, so tune in. Uh, um, he's had some great guests before, and uh, he'll probably have some more great guests in the future. But uh, so you you talked about Toad's Place. So uh, mm-hmm. today, uh, news uh, Bloomberg dot, dot com the the. News organization, oh, news organization founded yeah. by uh, the f- former mayor of New York City, uh, mm-hmm. Bloomberg, uh, is reporting that Yale wants to shut down Toad's Place uh, because of the yes. issues with underage drinking. Yeah. Uh, you know, Toad's Place is like they had the longest Bob Dylan concert in history, five hours set. Uh, yeah. They had the Rolling Stones there. They had Billy Joel there. They've had Bono, uh, U2 there. Uh, they used to be in the 70s and 80s. 
in the early 90s, the place where you would uh, go start your tour before you started your tour. Yeah. So uh, how does that make you feel? But the, I, I, obviously, underage drinking is an issue, and at a bar, it shouldn't happen. If you can ID people, you should be able to control the people that come to you. Well, you know, it's, it's an iffy thing. You see, I grew up in the 70s. Yeah. Now – and I'm not going to lie to you. I drank in bars before I was 18 years old because the drinking age was 18. When I, w- you know, when I was uh, 16 years old, the drinking age was 18. Yeah. I had a, mu- I grew a mustache, and and you, uh, and I used to talk with the, you know, just be able to get into the bar as long yeah. as you didn't cause any trouble. You used to get in. Now, the problem that we have in society today is the mothers against drunk driving don't want any uh, shenanigans going on. And, and the lobbyists have, have, uh, have really cracked down on the, the underage drinking in clubs. What's happened is they choked, they went down there, and they, they, they found out that the, they, they, they busted the bar. They went in there, and they, they ID'd every single person that was drinking, and they found out that there was 70% of the people were underage. Yeah. Well, no kidding. The guy who owns Toad's Place wants to stay open, so he, he would get, you know, they would have cl- the clubbers, you know, you had, you were allowed to go in there if you were under 21. Yeah. So, what would, you know, what are you going to do? You know, they would sneak drinks and everything with their friends. You know, if you're going to, if you want it bad enough, anybody's going to be able to get a drink, you know? Right. So, I really don't agree with Closing Toad's Place. It's an, it's actually an, uh, it, it's a monument to rock and roll. The yeah. Rolling Stones, Dylan, you know, Springsteen, yeah. you know, Clutch played there, you know, Marshall Tucker, Johnny Winter, Edgar Winter. Yeah. You know, come on. You can't. You can't shut down Toad's Place. What they could do is monitor it better. I don't even care if they didn't have any alcohol at Toad's Place. Yeah. You know, but it, it, I think the owner would care. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he does. Yeah. yeah. But it, it's it's funny because I don't know if the building is owned by Yale or I don't know who owns that building. I do not know. And there was an old uh, – oh, I forgot what the guy's name was. I remember the old owner of the uh, – Siegel, I think, owned the building at one yeah. time. And uh, – uh, it's, I don't know who owns it, and I know Yale doesn't own yeah. it, but a, a lot of people that go to Yale own it. Yeah. And, or a lot of people that go to Yale use that club. Yeah. And it's just, what are you going to do? You know, it's, it's the thing is about it. New Haven. I spent a lot of time in New Haven. But uh, 30 seconds? Three seconds? Okay. Uh, I'm like, uh, we're done. I'll see you later. But uh, <laughs> Yale is kind of. Yale two years ago over their their teachers union overthrew uh, the Del- the Stefanos people on the board of aldermen. Yes, uh, they have had this. They're actually trying to build a trolley from downtown New Haven to East Rock, New Haven, mm-hmm. to so the rich people who don't like to take the bus can use public transportation. Yes. So Yale's had this vice grip on the city over the past couple of years, and it's getting worse. Where Abad Pod was shut down because Yale's like, we're gonna shut you down for a year. A year. You can you can wait for a year, but uh, you still have to pay rent. They're, mm-hmm. like, they're like, well, we're gonna go out of business. They're like, all right, fine. Yeah, you and know, so th- things like that happening are, are just Yale is uh, it's an entity all in itself and everything, but it, it's also the people in New Haven are important to me too. Yeah, and the music scene's important to me too, and all the restaurants are important too. Yeah, so there has to be some give and take somehow. Yeah. It's important. As somebody that spends a lot of time in downtown New Haven, you know, mm-hmm. it's great that we have these great restaurants. It was great that they that they have uh, Shake Shack, like a you know, it's, it's it's something you get in New York City. That you get in New Haven now. Yeah. But did that building really need to be vacant for twelve years before they rented it out to anybody? I don't know. And, you know, and that's weird. When it was turned into the Shake Shack, I, we went there immediately. A little overpriced, yeah. but it's what you do. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a lot of fun. I went there. I got a shake. Yeah. You know, and we you know we go to Mamoons. We go to a lot of places. It's New Haven is New Haven. Let's face yeah. it, you know, and and you can't, you know, you, it's it got to be a give and take thing. We all have to get along, you know. Yeah. And, and it, you know, it's it, and it's a for any city that is New Haven is working on a lot of issues right now. It's trying to figure out what it wants to be, and Wallingford is better with a strong urban center close to it. All the suburbs are better with a strong New Haven, a safe New yeah. Haven, with better school systems in New Haven. So it, it benefits the whole community by having a strong New Haven. And you know, there's multiple ways for them to get to that point where they're strong and things are good again. And some of the ways just aren't necessarily good for people who don't live in New, who people who live in New Haven who aren't associated with the university. Well, yeah. you know, the, Wallingford is is a good suburban hub. Yeah. And you know what's really good about Wallingford? 
they got WPAA, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, WPAA. South Orchard Street. In you know, you New Haven doesn't even have its own uh, public access. It shares the public access with Hampton and West Haven. And I'll tell you, we got it right here, everybody. So come on down and start some TV. It's the, this is the, the best, the premier public <laughs> access studio in New Haven County. Bar none. We have we have people. We used to have people come out all the way from Bridgeport to co-host. All right, we have 14 seconds. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you, Bob Bob McCrowder, for uh, showing up. Uh, watch the show Tuesday at eight o'clock. All right, thank you everybody. Have a good night. See you next week. Actually, I won't see you next week. See you in two weeks. See you later. See you later. You there? I'm listening. <laughs> Remember Fraser Crane? So...